your beautiful smiling face out here. Boner. Oh wait, it's not the it's not the subject. Yeah, it's not the subject. This is this is not uh, adult <laughs> content. This is this is all ages. You know, family. This is a family show. Honestly, I tell <laughs> I tell this people all the time. I, I I run family wholesome family programming. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back to the sixth round post fight show with me, your host Zane Simon, and my co-host, as always, Eddie Mercado. We're coming to y'all just from the finale, the final of uh, the final fight of UFC on ESPN: Nami Yunus versus Hibash at the UFC Apex Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, yeah, there was a moment in there where this card was getting pretty fun. <laughs> what you know just just for a brief moment round or fights uh the the four main card first four main card fights mm -hmm. and then it just stopped dead man yeah and we even had a bite we had so another yeah. bite in the ufc we and had a disqualification because of a bite and that dude we we'll talk about it later but he already got the bite tattooed he got the bite tattooed, and he got a bite bonus. Yeah, he got a fifty thousand dollar <laughs> bite. Bonus. It was a lot of. It was turning up into be like one of those just super irrelevant, but ton of fun cards. And the main card was like finish, 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 finish. And then the heavyweights of all people were like, "Nah, let's slow things yeah, down yeah, here." That's... Having a bottom of the barrel heavyweight fight is your co-main event. Is never a smart idea. Like I get I was it. Shocked that this was the the co-main event. Yeah, I get that Carl Williams is an interesting prospect and all. I get that Justin Toff has gotten some big knockouts, but the fight we knew this fight was going to have happen is that Carl Williams was just going to take him down and lay on him a bunch. Like that that is the only way this fight goes unless Carl Williams gets knocked out in like a minute, and he almost did. He was taking knocked out, <laughs> but like otherwise, he was just going to get laid on Nitafa. So yeah, terrible booking for the co-main event. And then uh, yeah, as uh, one of our re our uh, viewers here noted, Rose ain't Rose at at women's flyweight. You know, like. Yeah. Rose got some miles on her. There, there's the miles, but she's also she was never like a powerful athlete at woman straw weight. She was fast. She had reach and range. She could she could put some surprising shots on people. And but at flyweight, like she's just not strong. She's just not a powerful flyweight, and. She's never been a busy, high-output fighter. So now you have somebody who's kind of low-output and doesn't hit really hard. And, uh, you know, like... I She was strong enough to hold Hebas down. For sure, but Hebas is... On a couple a, occasions. Hebas is a natural straw, straw weight, too. Like, Which is why I'm glad this is a flyweight. Like, I'm glad we got this fight now. This yeah, is probably sure. the best version of this fight, honestly. Yeah, and it wasn't a great fight. No, it was not a great fight. It was, <laughs> it was a problem that Rose that Rose was eminently prepared to solve, which is a you know arms elbows up, arms out, sort of all all hooks and face first striking style that Namunis could just slide away from and counter all night. And, and the spin and shit. Let's and the spin and shit. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and it was always going to be that. Nama Yunus is a better technician everywhere. So yeah. if Hebas was going to win this, she had to make it ugly. And she wasn't able to do that. No. She didn't have the footwork to do that. She didn't nope. have the skill set to do that. Yeah. I mean, she fought hard. Yeah. But she just was fighting a better technician. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the, like, I, I am not the person, despite doing the vivisection and all that and doing the scouting report and stuff and stuff like that in the past that I've done. I am not really the person to like really 
get on fighters over bad technique. I tend to think that you can get away. It, the, sort, the sport is chaotic enough and sandboxy enough that you can actually get away with a lot of stuff that just sort of practically works for the sake of how your game functions. But for Amanda Hebush, whatever coaches she's ha- had have got let her get away with bad punch form for so long that at the elite levels, her game just falls down. That's why I picked Rose here. Yeah, I, I picked her too for the same thing. It's just like you can't, you know, you're up here fighting like this at like the top level of your sport and throwing everything from your elbows. You're just always going to be really hittable and you're she you're not going to land. She was getting hit so clean out there. Yeah, it was. I mean, so clean. I mean, <laughs> Talk yeah. about no power. Rose did not have any power in that fight. Because yeah. I mean, Hibosh wore all of it really well. Yeah. And this is this is the point well made too. Amanda Hibosh's dad is her coach. Mm. And you know, out there in like round three, just being like, This is the round you knock her out. That's what we're you're gonna do. Go knock her out. And it's just like, yeah, but she's losing this fight. Maybe actually give her some some like technique tips to not lose. Right. Do you have any of those? I mean, she did go out and win that next round. She did win that round, but it was not like because she came close to knocking Rose Namajunas out. She just, she bullied her to the mat at one point. It was, you know, just sort of, wasn't even like a real takedown. She just kind of grabbed Namajunas and just pulled her over at some point. And then it was like a lazy hip toss. Yeah. Very great schoolish. It worked, but. Yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, just not a good fight. Rose Namajunas does not look powerful at, at straw weight or at fly weight, rather. And Am- Amanda Hebush is just, you know, even the best version of her game that she can put together is still has so many holes in it that it, it doesn't ever feel like it's going to be an elite MMA game. It, it's a leap for women's flyweight. No, it's not. No, what it's do you not. Mean? I mean, she She's couldn't right. beat Rose Namuna. She couldn't beat Macy Barber. She got tuned Barber's up. Good. Yeah, that's right. She's good. Any good fighter in that division tunes her up. She couldn't beat Caitlin Chukagian. Chukagian's good. What yes. Do you mean? I mean that it is fails to ever be elite. She can get close to that level, but she can't ever actually cross she, the I line mean, from. Yeah, I mean. Not a, uh, not a, not a contender uh, level. She can't ever be a contender. Sure, sure. You know, doesn't mean she's not elite. Yeah, it, it kind of does. I mean, she she's she can. Be, she's top fifteen fighter. Sure, she's good. She she's it's like Neil Magny is elite. Is that's Amanda Hebush is that level of elite. Neil she's Magny Neil has Magny. more wins in the welterweight division than anybody. Right, because he's... You you be careful, Zane Simon. Look, I'm not going to go all Anthony Smith out here. Anthony Smith would be (laughs) lucky to have Neil Magny's career. But at the same time, Anthony Smith has fought for a title. Never happened for Neil Magny, because it's welterweight and slight heavyweight. and Well, because there's actual, you know, martial arts going on at 170. Yeah, but Amanda Heba, she's in a division where, you know, uh, Jennifer Maya fought for a title, and... She's not gonna. At least not if she keeps going the way she is now. You know? Yeah, she definitely has a ceiling. Yeah. It, but it's not a physical ceiling. That's the thing. It's just a technical ceiling. But that's the, that's the bigger problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Otherwise, just kind of an uninspiring performance all around for the fight where he is just, you know, the flaws are too apparent for a good fighter. And for Nami Yunus, it's just, you know, I, I get that you, you were a big straw weight and, or not, I mean, not even five foot five. isn't like she was huge or something, but I get that her run kind of played out at straw weight sort of, but fly weight, it just kind of feels very un 
I don't know. It's just not. It's just not interesting. Rose Nam Yunus at flyweight. I'm just not excited for it. I'm excited for it. I want to see her fight Valentina. Sure. I mean, she'll get wrecked, but maybe I'm... I don't know. See, and that's the thing. Like Rose, sometimes she'll just show up, and sometimes she doesn't. Like, yeah, but she's not going to show up against an athlete like Shevchenko. She's just not. Not in that division. Fine. I'm here for it either way. I got. Yeah, they, I never wanted to see it before today. If they want to do that, that's fine. I'm and, also. Oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I think that should be the next move. Yeah, I mean, they could they could do you know a fight like Chikagian, uh Sermonara, but she's coming she's coming off a loss to Barber, so maybe more likely to do it, the the Macy Barber fight. Um, Nah, she her. should fight Valentina. Two former champions. The, the, the Valentina fight is one that just makes sense. As just like a fight that makes sense for Valentina in a uh, in a legacy kind of building fight for her where she gets to beat somebody else famous. I agree with uh, Tron here that I think the Valentina wrecks her. But you know what? It's not like Rose needs protecting. She yeah, exactly. she was a champion, you know. She knows she she's been in big fights her whole career. So if that's what happens, then that's what happens. Yeah, I would allow it. I'm not protective of Rose Nami Yunus. No, but, I mean, uh, yeah, that's there's no need for that. Because it's otherwise you just feed her to somebody like Natalia Silva, which I also think. Well, here's the thing: if Rose is going to get it. I'd rather I'd rather, I'd rather be from Valentina Shevchenko. Shevchenko. Yeah. Because if Rose loses again, the the chances of her and Valentina ever fighting kind of go away. Yeah. Her coming off a win right now in this division right now does make the Shevchenko fight make sense right now. And another win or two. And I mean, you know, does Nami Yunus really have that much passion for MMA? I, I don't I don't know, because they talk like, oh, she's fa falling out of love with it, the sport, and but she's back now. And it's kind of like, yeah, she, she doesn't really fight like a person who's really like, it's not like Dustin Poirier out there in his late career where you're like, man, he's still, this is a dude who still wants it every time he steps in the cage. You know? Rose fought smart out there. She That's fought smart, but she also, at the end of the fight, when she's out there like raising Hebus' arm at the end there, and it's like, can I, 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 she, you know, it, it was it was a weird sort of bluff almost at the end of this fight because Hebush is out there. She's like cheering for herself and Nami Yunus is just kind of like, yeah, whatever. And then the, the decision gets read and Hebush is like, yeah, I knew that was coming. And Rose is like, yeah, I knew that was coming. They're like, Where was your body language at the end of this? Were both of you just trying to bluff one another? I don't like, know. What is this? I feel like Rose kind of knew she had it the way she was talking to the ref. Yeah, She's but she also was it. acting like at the end of the fight, just like she didn't look like a fighter happy with what she'd done out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't um, know. I, mean, I think honestly, I think I think she's a little surprised with her own performance, but not in a good way. Yeah, she, maybe she, seemed, she sounded a little down on herself. Yeah. Like she was self aware that hey, I look slow out there compared to the mm -hmm. old ones. You know, so it definitely seems like she knows there's lots to work on still. She kept saying it. Yep. So, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Just the fight was, I this this card really needed a main event, just because the stakes for Nami Yunus versus Hibush were not high. This is not like a contenders fight in that in in the flyweight or the flyweight division or anything like that. And if this had been the co-main to a really good, meaningful fight on top, I wouldn't be that down on it. But as a main event, after that Carl Williams-Justin Toffa fight, it really just felt like... It was the definition of one of those fights that's just a low simmer all the way through, and you keep hoping that it'll turn into something better, and it just never does. Yeah. Not, not, uh... Not a lot of fun. I could have done without the main event and the co-main event. They could have stopped at Shabazian. Yeah, well, for for what the 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 event turned out to be in terms of entertainment value, yes, yes, like the the whole thing could have just stopped much earlier. But uh, 
All right, let's talk about this Carl Williams Justin Toffa fight here for a minute. Um, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was afraid of this too. And I even fucking tweeted out before and I was like, there's no way these heavyweights are going to break this finish streak on the main card. Right? Question mark. Yeah. Shit. I knew it, dude. I fucking knew it. Why? Yeah. Why was this the co-main event? It's terrible. It's they're talking cool. about afterward too, like, oh, this is the gateway to the top 15 in the heavyweight division. And part of me is like, oh, that's you know, that's delusional and awful. And then the rest of me is like, you know what? That might be true. Cause yeah, but, but like, that's, that's, that's like I know. Captain obvious shit. I know, but all you gotta it, do is win a couple fights and you're there. That's yeah. It. I and know. Bare minimum. Just win three in a row and you're fucking ranked. That's it's it. true. Cause yeah, I'm looking at the rankings and what the bottom the bottom three in the heavyweight top fifteen are Alexander Romanov, Marco Sajeria de Lima, and Rodrigo Nascimento. Yeah, put Kevin Williams in there with any of those dudes. That's fine. Whatever. Yeah, just Who don't cares? make it a fucking co main event. Yes. Could still, that could that is pre top fifteen bottom of the top fifteen heavyweight is prelim opener fodder. Still. One round. Uh, it should only yes. be one round. One ten minute round. No, one five yes. minute round. <laughs> Slow down. One what? ten minute round. No, I you gotta get the humor in there, Eddie. It, it has to. It can't be heavyweight if it's not. If the potential for it to be funny isn't I'll there. I'll settle for seven and a half minutes. Okay, okay, seven and a half. <laughs> Fine. That's it though. <laughs> I, I, man, him and Ogden. Yeah. Seven and a half minutes. I don't want to see anything else out of those guys. <laughs> but seven and a half minute fights. I'm starting a list. Yeah, that's seven right. And a half the seven, the seven and a half club. I'm writing it down. All right. Before that, an actually fun fight: Edmund Shabazian, AJ Dobson, and uh, oh yeah, it is Carl Williams, not Kevin Williams. Whoops, that, that shows how much I care. Sorry, oh, yeah. sorry, Carl. And if there's a Kevin Williams out there, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah, how dare you? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Shabazian Dobson. And, uh, yeah, this was Dobson. You know what? Props to him. He showed up, and he showed up with something new in his game because I felt pretty confident going into this that A.J. Dobson didn't really have a lot to offer Edmund Shabazian. Like... He's fast, he's athletic, he can crack a little, but a his output has always been really low. And it's just like a, a slow-paced kind of pot-shotting fighter against Shabazian. You're just playing his own game that Shabazian's better at. Yeah. But Dob Dobson, he showed up and he went after it. He, he was throwing volume. Yeah, he looked confident. Mm -hmm. look confident and i was not confident picking shabazi in here well yeah i get that i hated it i didn't want to do it i had to do it but i didn't want to do it yeah and uh and like the second the fight started i was like damn yeah. it i knew it this is why i didn't want to pick shabazi in. i shouldn't have done it and then out of fucking nowhere shabazi is like you know what i'm recovered let me stand up and just knock this dude out yeah <laughs> I mean, there's there's that. I you know, this is also like Shabazian has moved to the, the uh, extreme couture, and he is a guy who I think honestly that Glendale Fight Club camp they gave him some good technique to build on. He's you know you not actually a bad boxer. Sure, fundamentals. But they are not. They, they was clearly it was a camp that always coddled Ronda Rousey, and I think they probably coddled him too, because he was a fighter who came to the UFC absolutely used to being the hammer, had never been the nail. And Extreme Couture, you know, they're getting him some backbone because he got beat on here and he bounced right back, and that's the kind of thing where I think two or three years ago that wouldn't have happened. I'm shocked he didn't just implode and quit. Yep. <laughs> and it took a lot longer for him to, 
to get put away by uh, Anthony Hernandez, too, in what was a nightmare matchup from the beginning for him. Like, he, he kept Man, it together. Dude, honestly, this whole fucking division is a nightmare matchup for him. Yeah, but he's Bobby he's learning to keep division. it together a lot better. And it's good to, it's a good sign for him cuz the raw talent is there, but sure. he just he has to get used to being the nail sometimes. And I think it's starting to happen. Hopefully. Yeah. Still to this date his only solid win is Brad Tavares. No, it's yeah, there's there is still, you know, there is still a uh, glass cannon feeling to him. No question. But he at least, he, when he's been struggling lately, it's looked more and more like he's a guy who doesn't just fall apart. Yeah, he he's a weird one, man. And I can't believe he's only 26. Mm-hmm. That, that tickles me. <laughs> I feel like he's been around so long. That like he's got to be at least put almost forty. But yeah, he's not that, even thirty yet. That is, I mean, it is also the classic kind of why I worry about guys who turn pro as teenagers is just like I don't trust the level of training that most fighters are getting as a teenager. And like, if you're going pro at that point, like, how many bad habits do you have ingrained that you're just never going to break? You know. I forgot he was on the Contender Series. Yeah. Holy shit. Wow. Season two. It kind of makes more sense now. <laughs> Damn. But yeah. Yeah, I am I'm, I am reasonably... I, I feel decent about what Shabazian showed in this fight, which was that he could take a beating and bounce back and, and win. Yeah. It's and I like, first honestly, time. honestly, I feel bad for Dobson because he has had a rough run of it in the UFC and he really showed up for this and met a much more resilient Edmund Shabazian. Uncharacteristically resilient Edmund Shabazian. And I'm sure yeah. Shane, I'm fucking positive. I've never been more just, dialed in that this has nothing at all to do with the lack of USADA in the UFC at all. You're gonna, you're, this is going to be a whole thing now. I, just, I didn't, you know what? I somehow the naivety, my Pollyanna nature really did not see coming that this would become like the big, the next big conspiracy theory in the UFC to drive us forward for the next five years. You think Chris Weidman's losing? <laughs> How many donuts you want to bet? I don't. I mean, the thing is, is that even a shot Chris Weidman should be able to beat uh, Sadiq, or not Sadiq, but uh, Sadriquis Dumas should. But all I'm even saying, Usada shows up, Weidman goes down. USADA leaves. Who I knows? Guess. The sky's the limit. <laughs> <sighs> Man, I'm gonna. I was not prepared for this to be the the discourse of the of our era. Like, but Walt Harris. But Walt Harris. No, no, nobody's gonna try that. He's the. That's he, He's the. He's the exception that proves the rule. He's gonna be the guy that they made an example out of, so that everybody else can get away with it. Yeah, hundred percent. But. The loss, the, the antitrust era has ended. The post USADA era has begun. Shit's about to get fucking weird. All right. I ought to make a I ought to make a post USADA list. We got OSP, Shabazi, and Weidman. RDA. <laughs> RT fucking A. All right. Um, I'm just waiting for Johnny Hendricks to come back. Yeah, Shabbat. So what? But what? What do we do now with Shabazian? Is Junyan Park my eternal favorite? When you need a guy for a good scrap, is that the Iron Turtle? The Iron Turtle. Ooh, yeah. Yes. Do that. Sold. Say less. Say less. All right. All right. Yeah. Other. Yeah. I honestly, I could ha try to bring another another idea to the table, but that's just a good I'll one. I'll never turn down the Iron Turtle. Ooh. 
or Gregory Rodriguez, Hobo Cop. Don't do that to Shabahi, <laughs> you piece of shit. Say why? <laughs> Let him have a moment. He can't oh. have one moment. <laughs> You're gonna send him to his death. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch it though. I'd, I'd watch it with glee. <laughs> Evil-eyed glee. All right. Now, talk talk about a bantamweight fight. I, 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 I almost felt like I had to bite back my read on this because I saw pe- so many people being like, nah, Cameron Simon, he's the real deal. He is going to show Peyton Talbot a new level or something. Nah. And I'm just like, going in, I'm just like, Cameron Simon has had to fight life and death with Mana Martinez and Steve Coslo. Like, those were scraps. Sure, he dominated Terrence Mitchell, but Terrence Mitchell is, like, the worst athlete the UFC's ever signed. And I say this as a fellow Alaskan. It's okay for me to criticize my, my Alaska brethren. But uh, Peyton Talbot is like an elite. He is a he is a top tier prospect. This He's kid is a level athlete. A level athlete, and the biggest thing is, you know, and I know he got he gets wild. He got he like ran himself into a bunch of like stifling. I just want to cling on to you grappling in his last fight, which is hard to fight. If somebody just wants to hold on to you, that is actually hard to fight off. You know. That's all they want to do. But Talbot is not only is he a top-level athlete, but he is a top-level athlete who understands how MMA is fought right now. Like, what is the meta? How to be assertive and aggressive. And the big thing that we saw in this fight that is scary is now he understands distance. Think that that Aguirre fight made him understand don't walk all the way in on your opponent and close yourself out of your best range. Because he got out there with Simon. He got on the edge of his punching range, and he just stayed there. I was like, I'm just going to fuck you up for you know dude. for every minute this lasts. You fucking terrorize Simon, dude. Yeah. That was so wicked. The way he was just blending his elbows and his knees. That knee to the neck <laughs> as like Simon shooting. I don't and know just- how he ate that. And just backing right off and like being like, no, I'm just going to get back to my distance and start marching you down all over again. Dude, this was scary. This was, this yeah. was. And the best thing is too, to, to see like, you know, uh, Simon, he did not go away. He did not fold. He even, you know, he started to put together some shots at the end of the first round. We're like, you know, Simon's not out of this. Mm-hmm. And you get into the second. So you're like, okay. So does does Talbot start to feel like okay? I threw all my best stuff at this guy. He didn't go away. Starting to does he get does his confidence take a little hit? Does he start to get into a wilder fight? Does his form does break down? Gas? Does he start to gas any of that? Just came right out there and detonated him. It's just like nope, right back to edge of the pocket, just taking you apart every single moment you give me something to take. This was so bad of an ass whooping that the ref stopped it at a moment where, like, he probably couldn't have stopped. Like, he would have been fine not stopping it, but not yep. a single person. Not nobody. Said yeah. anything. Everyone was like, nope. thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt like mercy. Well that done. A mercy stoppage. Yeah. I tell, but people better, you know, that division better watch out because you That's get somebody. The prospect. You know, let, let, the stats on that. Everything was significant. Every strike was significant. Every strike was significant. And the man landed 61%. He threw 129 significant strikes in a round and a minute. No, a round and 21 seconds. Five minutes, 21 seconds. He threw 129 significant strikes and he landed 80, 79 of them. Just that's insane, man. I mean, you know, I picked him to win, but I thought it was gonna be close. I I talked myself into believing it might be close, even though my read was just like, no, this is Simon is a pace fighter who makes a lot of mistakes, and he's gonna be fighting a more athletic pace fighter. 
Like, even if Talbot makes a lot of mistakes, that is just the perfect fight for Talbot. Is somebody else who's going to give him a lot all the time and try to match his pace. Yeah. You know? I can't wait to watch him again. Yeah. I, I wrote a editorial a few years back after, right after Max Holloway tuned up, uh, oh, uh, Ortega? no, the one where he set the record, um, Cater. Yeah. Right after he tuned up Cater, I wrote an editorial about how Max Holloway is showing you what the future of MMA is. Mm. That he is, you know, it may be a, a record that doesn't get met for a long time, but he is showing you what the, the modern evolution of the game is, and it is extreme pace and volume. And it's kids like Talbot that watch that kind of fighting, and they're like, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm going to do. And you can see it. Like, that's the evolution. That is the younger generation, what they, what yeah. they latched on to. He's 25. He was born in 98. <laughs> yeah, baby. That's insane, dude. And he looks so composed out there. And yep. You know what he it reminded me of? It reminded me of how Robbie Lawler used to walk down motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. dude, he would just walk and Simon down behind some heavy shit. But doing it at like double the pace that Lawler did it. You know, that's the thing with these yeah. this new generation. It's like they are just throwing so much. You know, I, I remember like part of the thing I Doing that editorial, I went in and looked at it, and it was, you know, finding out that, like, you know, Kamaru Usman, and Kamaru Usman was, like, easily outstripping Anderson Silva for, like, pay, for pace, you know, you mean, of like, strikes thrown. Yeah, kind of yeah, for the volume per minute of, like, what he's throwing. And just, like, you know, guys that you don't think of knowing for the striking... Like Habib Nurmagomedov just easily outstripping GSP, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you also have to think about it's weight class related. The lighter you go, the more volume you're going to get. That's just, yeah, but it way. worked. But I mean, you know, even, but even like BJ Penn, okay, you know, Habib Nurmagomedov easily outstripping BJ Penn then, you know, like, BJ These guys from a different time. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Is it like the, the evolution, how it was going is that like the modern, the modern fighters throw so much more than, than the guys we, we used to watch, you know, just insanely more wrestlers, guys we think of as like, this is not a striker throw so much more strikes. Colby Covington works in way more volume mm -hmm. than, you know, mm -hmm the dudes that came before him. Yeah. So Peyton Talbot, he is the future, you know? Yeah. He's, I don't know if I'm higher on another band and weight as much yeah. as I am this guy. And it's that division is a division full of killers. So to be like, Oh, this guy, this kid is probably a future champ in a division like that. Like, you know, hundred percent. Blue chip prospect. Yeah. Uh I don't really care who he fights next, but let's see. What's the the hardest reasonable step up he could take? Uh Bantamweight. Organize this by record. And you could you could do like I mean it would be a hell of a step, but you could do like Peyton Talbot, Douglas De Silva. Oh, dude, <laughs> you might as well put him in there with Christian Rodriguez. Yeah, well, Christian Rodriguez is up at featherweight now. He is has he? to be. But is he? Uh, he's. I, I don't he think was, he's. I thought drop. he was only doing that because he missed weight twice in a row. Yeah, but I don't know if he can actually make weight. Book honestly. it. Book it. Or you could do him against, you know, well, Iman Zahabi's on a run. Peyton mm. Talbot, Iman Zahabi. Mm. You know? By the way, pick Zahabi in that one. Yeah. Over Basharat. <sighs> or uh, somebody else mentioning Victor, Victor Henry. Yeah. Mm. This is... I, I see this with the 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 Anderson Silva 
volume th- or power thing, but it's it's. I'm actually just talking like strikes per minute. You know, you go to like Anderson Silva, Talis Latis, or and you know fights where Anderson Silva had plenty of fights that went all the rounds that went multiple rounds. The actual volume people are throwing is just way higher. I mean, the meta in general used to be for champions. You become champ. You become lower output. You slow it down. You become more commanding and controlling. You know, you, Jose Alt. Uh, Jose Aldo, wild man on the come up, really stayed structured champ kind of thing. GSP, same big, way. Big time. But now it really is much more like even when you're champ, you've got to be out there throwing in volume because the guys that are coming up, I mean, you got Izzy trying to be that kind of classic champ. Sean Strickland goes out there and it's just like, here's a jab and a ton of pressure. And is he losing his belt to Sean Strickland? You know, like the meta is just bending to a very different style than it used to be. Anyway, I could rant for and keep us here all night, so I will. I will try to do that. Yusuf Zalal, though, with the night's big upset over Billy Quarantillo, and um, Quarantillo, a dude who is always happy to fight from behind. He is a comeback king, a guy who's always just like, "Yeah, you can do whatever you want as long as I'm get, as long as I'm scrapping with you and I can get my game going." Thing is, though, when you start losing a step, or just when your opponent is really controlled, being always a step behind, that just means you're going to lose all the time. This was a really weird fight for Billy. Yeah. I wonder if he was injured. I Could saw some things circling around online about his arm. Like maybe he had this mm. arm injury. Could and like be injured. He even addressed it and was like, no, nah, my arm's fine. Could be an injury. Uh, I... Z- going into this, like fight week, Zalal was the underdog. Oh, yeah. I mean, Zalal is. After the weigh ins. Oh, he switched. It flipped. Flip-flop. Oh, somebody yeah. might know something. But, uh, you know, the, Billy Q is also a dude who has made his whole career about wars, and he's 35. Like, Yeah, that's true, too. That, that can't happen forever. Um, And it's also just like Zalal was, that was a perfect performance. He was just really controlled. And like I say, Quarantillo is a dude who, he will let you lead. He will let you throw first. He will let you do work with the idea that if I can land a big clubbing shot, if I can swing and cling on you and drag you to the mat, even if I'm pulling guard, and if I can make the fight tough on you, then I can turn the momentum in my favor. That's always how he's fought. And Zalal just, he did everything right. Do I need to put Zalal on my USADA list or no? No, not. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. All right. I had to ask. I mean, you know, he's a 27-year-old who has been in the UFC before. He should be getting better. It In a vacuum, he should be getting better. It's and, just wild to see Billy Q go beat Damon Jackson and then come out and just get absolutely pants by Yusuf Zalal. Yeah. That but, is weird. Damon da- Damon Jackson is not a good athlete, not a strong guy, and for you, you know for Quarantillo to be able to go out there and like win a hard fight against him, I'm I'm you know I'm not surprised about that, and for Zalal to be maybe stronger than Damon Jackson, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me either. Yeah, and certainly way more technical than Damon Jackson. Uh, but yeah, you know, glad to see. I'm just glad to see Zalal back and in form in the UFC. The kid had he has a really tight put together game, and it just wasn't it wasn't powerful enough the first time he was here, and it looked a lot more dynamic, it looked a lot stronger, and a lot more confident this time around. And he really dialed in those calf kicks. Yeah. He yeah. came out just spamming those things. Awesome move. Very smart. Yeah. Hey, you know, Julian Arosa just got a big win. I don't like to match people from the same cards that just fought, but uh, I'd watch Arosa's a lol. 
That sounds like a wild ride. That sounds like a wild ride. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, there's so, somebody here suggesting the, the Algeo Nelson winner. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, I, I'll watch off a performance like that. I mean, hey, Christian Rodriguez, if he's not going to go back down to to uh, to Bantamweight, I'd watch Rodriguez the law. That would Gabriel be fantastic. Miranda. Sure. All sorts of fights in that division for him. Muhammad Naimov just came off a win over Eric Silva. I'd watch that, you know. Really just mix it up with anybody outside the top 15. That, that'll that work. Uh, all right. Featherweight bout, Fernando Padilla, Luis Pauelo. Uh, I didn't want to say it before he made his debut, but uh, Luis Pauelo is just not ready for the UFC at all. He's just a formless brawler who is used to beating up really bad competition. You implying he's a can crusher? I'm I'm implying that the Peruvian MMA scene may still not be as developed as it needs to be to really compete. Doesn't PFL have a Peruvian champion? Uh, you know, maybe PFL isn't the uh, deepest <laughs> talent pool in the world. What are you talking about? They have the 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 heavyweight champion of the world. That that you know what they do. They may not have any other heavyweight worth a damn, but they've got that one. Uh, yeah, but this was cool, man. Padilla is a fucking he's sharp, man. When he's you give on, him his on. right kind of fight, he is a killer. Yeah, he's lethal, man. This was this was the perfect fight for him. So, yeah. But it's pretty when he gets these matchups, you know, that's that's highlight material right there. Mm -hmm. like the dude knows how to finish. Yeah. And he's... It's violent. It's fun. And like he just hit a standing Dars. It's a club and sub. Yep. Awesome fight. Awesome performance from him. Pawelo, pa I'm sure they can find some other fights for him, but it's going to be tough going in the UFC. I, I hate to say it. It's going to be fun, though. It'll be fun. He is he is going to go out on his shield every single time. And no there's question. plenty of guys that'll brawl with him. Yeah. He'll get some wins. All right. Before that, my my depressing fight of the night, Trey Ogden, Kurt Hollabaugh. And I second, was second guy on my list of the seven and a half minute club. Yeah. I was I was I was really hoping Kurt Hollabaugh could pull this out because I did not want to see the fight I knew Trey Ogden could win. And Hollabaugh is such a violent son of a bitch that I was really hoping that he would just get those. And every time he had it, uh, he had had this fight standing, he had Ogden looking like he didn't know what to do out there. But that was like one minute of every round. If that. If that. <laughs> If that, man, this dude, Ogden went full blanket. Yeah. Full, he had some ground and pound, but for the most part, just controlling positional grappling, which yeah. it's a win and a win bonus, but I don't like watching this guy fight. No. He is, he is, a, he is a true neutralizer out there, a, a, a reductive fighter, a fighter who his whole game is built around taking tools away from his opponent. And that's not fun to watch. I mean, he, I respect it because it's difficult to do, but it is not fun to watch. No, it's not fun to compete against. It's not no. fun to watch. It's zero you, fun, period. You need these fighters to exist out there. Because they are teaching moments for opposition for other fighters, you have to have these kinds of tests out there in the world. But it's a necessary evil. I'll it's a necessary that. evil, but it is like he should never be off the prelims. Yeah, he should never go above seven and a half minute rounds. Yes, yes, one, one seven, seven minute, and a half minute round. Minute round. That's, yep. it, That's it. That's all you get. Yeah, I'm not even going to try to make a next fight. I don't care. Just. He'll he'll be a problem for whatever guy that he has to face, and he's like the I, new, he's the new Nick Lentz. Yeah, but yeah. at least Nick Lentz would start scrapping after a while or catch a guillotine. 
Yeah, it's he's much more like you know on the uh, Stevie Ray scale or like Dan Bobish. <laughs> I mean, you know, or like uh, down at Bantamweight. Uh, oh God, what's Chris Gutierrez? He is a he, he is a neutralizer. At least, at least Goot will will knock people out on occasion. On occasion, if he gets the right moment. But yeah, oh, man, Ogden might be my least favorite fighter to watch. Yeah, or T Bow is one of our our listeners has mentioned. That's yeah, a okay. That's a that's a great neutralizer as well. Just there are guys out there where like if you're a range fighter, they'll get in your face and take you down, and just kind of like. Take take away that. If you're a brawler, they'll be at range and they'll just pick at you, and they'll just make sure that no matter what, the fight doesn't happen. Right. That's the that's the kind of guy. Yeah, it's it's the um, it's like the little league dad defense. Yeah, you know what I mean, like I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want to stop the the, the scuffle. Yeah. You know, yeah, he's down there negotiating. Yeah, you know what I mean, come on, just simmer down, bud. Simmer down. Yeah. He's not really trying to end the fight. All right. That brings us to a featherweight bout. Julian Arosa, Ricardo Hamosh. And this was a, I picked Hamosh going in on like a coin flip. Cause I'm like, I don't know if Arosa's game really works anymore. He hasn't seemed as aggressive as he used to be. And he's always been chinny. So being less aggressive and still not durable. Seems like bad news. <laughs> but at the same time, Ricardo Hamosh is a guy who is terrible at fighting moving backwards if Rosa can push forward and kind of has some quit in him. That, <sighs> like, I don't want to say that about a fighter because fighting is hard and it is a place that, like, you know, it is natural to not want to get beat on more. But Hamosh does seem like a dude who, when things get, when the tough, when the, when the going gets tough, he does not get going. Uh, that could be true, but I don't think that's what happened here. Yeah, I think he farted in the brain. I think he made a big fat FIQ mistake. Like he was tagging Arosa on the feet, and he's like, "Oh, I'm hurting this dude. Let me blast double him." Why? He, so yeah, he also stuck his head right into a guillotine against Charles Jordan as well. Like, but like, why is he like he didn't have to grapple with this guy at all? He was tagging him on the feet. He was hurting him. Fucking separate. Knock but him he's, out. he's supposed to be a good grappler. Like, he's just for a man that is supposed to have the grappling chops. He does. He's just way too easy to catch. And yeah, and honestly, that was a loose-looking guillotine. That's the thing. That's why I'm kind of like, you know, he's got the rep Charles Oliveira used to have and totally shed, where mm. you just like, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you're amazing, but also we all remember that time where you looked like you kind of got hit in the collarbone and you were just like, I'm done. You know? Wow. What a what a what an analogy. That's that's pretty spot on. Maybe if if he can uh, shake it, I guess. Yeah, it's just <sighs> he's just one of those uh, yeah. who's not trustworthy. No, yeah. I think it's a five Q thing and, and a little bit of what you're saying also. I think yeah. he could have won this fight handily if he just kept it standing and didn't yeah. try to grapple. I also feel like you're right there. You're almost like you're posturing Rosa up a little. You put the forearm across the neck when you're trying to slam him down, but he just kind of got up and was like, oh, nope, never mind. Tap. Like, I'm done. Well, I mean, the secret I, I, was Rosa locked up the guillotine and uh, Hamos tried to get out of the guard. Right? Yeah. He was fighting the legs like you should, but he lost that battle. So once he lost that battle, he's still in the guillotine. He puts both hands on the on the mat and he postures up. He tripods. He gets on his feet. Arosa just hangs on for dear life. Like he was gonna die on that hill. If 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 Hamosh did get out, Arosa might have blown his arms out. 
because he was giving everything to that squeeze. Yeah. And like, I think he knew in his brain from, from watching that, uh, Jordan fight that if, if he could just hold that guillotine for just a little bit longer, that fucker's going to tap. And Dude. Th that whole sequence was enough for him to be like, all right, I'm not getting out. Yeah. Of course, then, uh, as, as also one of our listeners noted, Rosa went and said a bunch of stupid stuff in the presser about uh, trans athletes. I don't know where his brain rot is coming from, but I congratulate Rosa on his plans to transition. And uh, Wait, what? <laughs> what the fuck? What he was I miss, saying dude? that he hopes that a, a trans swimmer turn, turns to women's MMA because then he'll he'll go become a woman and fight them. And uh, you know, great, great, uh, Julian. You get on your you get on your drugs, and we'll all start using she/her pronouns for you. And whatever. It was. It's just. I'm, I'm sorry. Definitely. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, I I don't expect fighters to be good people. So I'm not really surprised and I don't really, you know, I'm moving on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Bantamweight bout, Miles Johns, Cody Gibson. And uh, I feel for Cody Gibson, man. Why? Because he's just not athletic. I don't for him. <laughs> he went out, he goes out there and he works really hard. And it's just like he just doesn't have any of the athletic tools to get the things done that he wants to get done. Where like he spent all this time pressuring Johns, but could not let land or let anything go. Spent all this time wrestling with Johns and could not ever get or maintain dominant positions. And it's just like the the will is there, but the physical ability is just not did you just realize this no i knew this i picked against him but i just feel okay. bad for I, I feel bad for anybody who's in that position because athleticism is cheating and it sucks to just not be st strong or fast and have somebody who's like athleticism you know, is, is cheating like miles johns is out there huffing and puffing for two whole rounds of this fight like gassed but he can just land one bomb that like moves Gibson back five feet every time he throws or just hit one double leg and hold him down. And it's just like, oh, there's nothing you can do about it. You're just That's not the beauty of sport. It yeah. is. I, that is why I love sports. That is why I watch. It's just like, I, I actually do enjoy people see seeing people meet the hard limit that is actually out there because there's this whole mantra, especially prevalent in the sports world that like, Oh, you can do everything through hard work. If you go out and you work hard enough, you can achieve. And it's just like, I'm sorry, but... I'm going to take that a step further, Zane. Think about the martial arts world. Yeah. Like how many fucking hobbyists are out there? Yeah, the mantra Thinking is... that they can fuck someone up. Yeah, and it's just like, I'm sorry, but the man who's got one leg that's an inch shorter than the other cannot outrun Usain Bolt. It's just never going to happen. Like... You can work your whole as hard as you want for your whole life, and you will be limited based purely on some genetics that you cannot overcome. And we kind of, you know, it's a lesson that gets taught to us all the time, like that sports teaches all the time. That's and, why we have the Olympics. Yep. And I, I kind of love it, but I always feel a little bit bad for the guys that just aren't athletic. And are out there really giving it their all and believe, believe, achieve, you know, <laughs> if you believe, it, believe, you conceive, it. achieve, <laughs> uh, achieving their way Dude, as pro athletes. I, can't, I cannot forget that video of Gibson in that like street fight where he's like, I know Google, Google me. me bitch I'm a UFC fighter I know I know what a, he, he's been a really like cool dude for MMA Twitter and like been around being like a really fun guy to chat with and stuff for a lot of people for a long time after that. But that is the thing he's known for forever. And, but my thing is like, you're not taking him down and you're going to go compete against miles Johns who like all he's going to want to do is take you down. Nah, fam. <laughs> I don't trust. His yeah, guy. no. And he's the worst part is, is that he's like a career wrestling coach. Like that is what he does in his spare time, Gibson. He's a high school wrestling coach. 
and maybe he's a great coach. It doesn't take you don't have to be a great a great at you know a great athlete to be a great coach. Hundred percent. I can go teach a, a kid's class in jujitsu. Sure. You know what I mean. <laughs> but I feel for it. I, I I feel just a little bit for him. All right. After that, featherweight bout, Jarno Aaron's. You ought to feel bad for Miles John, who got that weird no contest because of that situation with the supplements that weren't tainted, and they got this thing mixed up. That's yeah, what you feel bad for sure. I, I feel bad for him too. I the drug testing stuff is. Uh... Hey, let me ask you this: when when something like that happens, when a fighter like fighter A wins the match, but later on it gets turned to a no contest, do they have to return their win bonus? I think so. I think they might. Do they? I, you know, I'm not on. Honestly, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Who would I think. Know? Like who can we I, ask? Yeah. The UFC. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd have to ask the fighters honestly who've had it happen to them. But uh, yeah, I, I think that might actually be the case. Honestly. Yeah. Yikes. Because I know if you get a no contest on the night, you don't get a win bonus. Right. You know? Right. Right away. So. Maybe I'll ask yeah. Johns. I'll yeah. I'll get a hold of him. Uh, all right. That brings us to a featherweight bout. Jarno Aaron's Steve Wynn. And uh, honestly, this was a great, this was a great to see evolution in Jarno Aaron's game. Cause I picked win going into this. And the big reason was both men like to watch their work, but Aaron's has been like a one shot at a time kind of like, Oh, let me try something creative. Here's a jump knee. Here's a back fist, you know, that kind of stuff kind of fighter. And win has been, a, he's a very counter combinations throw, you know, he, he waits too much and he covers and he lets his opponent get off first too much, but he throws in volume when he throws. So I was kind of like, okay, I'll pick win just in that kind of matchup. Seems more likely he'll let his hands go more. Aaron's came out and he threw in volume for the first time in his career. And he just ran away with the fight. He looked good. You know, he looked confident in his work. He and he never let Win back into the fight. And every time it seemed like Win might be finding his rhythm and might be finding his confidence, he got hurt. He got stung by something. Yeah, especially oh. his leg kicks, those calf kicks. Yeah, it was sweet. This was a tough fight, though. I mean, he was definitely busted up. Oh sure, yeah. But he 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 never lost. He never got discouraged. You know, he kept just yeah. kept after it. Good to see for Aaron's who. Just, you know, he's always been an, an action fighter, but he was always a one pot, one shot at a time action fighter. Him going out and just throwing and being a little bit reckless and trusting his durability a little, it's going to make him a lot better in the UFC. And a lot more fun. <laughs> and a lot more fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Super fun fight from him. Love to see it. Speaking of not super fun fights. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Zelezhnikova, Rendon. Um, I had hoped this would be a fight where either one of these women would just blow the other one away, where Rendon would get a takedown, and the fact that Zelezhnikova can't grapple would be poison, or where Zelezhnikova would stay standing, and Ren the fact that Rendon is slow as molasses would just be horrible for her. But instead... Rendon was Zelezhnikova was just a little too able to a little too fast on the floor for Rendon to hold down, and Rendon was just a little too tough for Zelezhnikova to actually beat up. So they just had a brutal slog. No, this really speaks to the division. Yeah, it's god awful. It's not high level. No, it's embarrassing. Yeah, it's um. I hated everything about this. Those Rendon takedown attempts were just so painful to watch. Just the, I, I, I just, everything about this was terrible. The striking was terrible. They started agreeing to do these whirling dervish spins. Like the, the all the missing back fists. Hebosh had a little bit of that in her tonight. Like, 
I hated this fight with a passion. This was ugly and disgusting and not high level MMA. Yeah. I'm sorry, but anyway, moving along. We don't have to <laughs> yeah. talk about it anymore. We've got something better to talk out about, which is Andre Lima, Igor Severino. Yes. And a we got, a, we got Mike Tyson. Yeah, a new MMA meta has entered the field. Mike Kyle. The, the cannibalism base. Yes. The cannibalism base. Not jujitsu. Cannibalism is living in his metabolism for yeah. sure. Not jujitsu, not wrestling, not kickboxing or Muay Thai. Hunger. That is the real base of MMA. Where do you think he bit his style from? <laughs> he's got Should that dog. Again? He's got that dog in him, Eddie. <laughs> no bark, all bite. All bite. All bite. Man, what the hell was I so Severino, for those that didn't watch, I'm assuming most of you did. It was a really fun competitive fight. Severino was doing all the pressuring, getting some takedowns, landing some good shots. Sever or Lima was looking much cleaner and slicker, landing big, powerful counters, doing all the scramble back to his feet, doing a lot of fence grabbing. And if I had to guess, if I had to just take a wild stab in the dark, Severino probably got really pissed off about all the cage grabs that were not being called or done anything about at all. His corner was certainly screaming about it all the time. So he could probably hear that too. And he decided that his best way to take care of that problem in a fight that he very easily could have won and could have been winning. I don't even know what the scorecards were, but his, his answer to the problem was, to bite Lima really hard on the underside of his arm from a rear waist cinch. And I don't know about you, but when Lima first started complaining about it, I was like, okay, what is he complaining about? And then the ref comes in and like turns around and is like, okay, this is a DQ. And I'm like, why are you stopping the fight? Even if he did, like, nip him. I have seen a boxer get bit twice. <laughs> and the, the refs let the fight keep going. Mike Kyle and Wes Sims. Mike Kyle yeah. bit Wes Sims mid-fight. Wes Sims had a big old bite mark on him. Fight yeah. Continued. <laughs> I've seen this happen before. I'm like, why? The and then they showed it. And it's like, yeah, okay, no. He really got in there on it. It Justin was. And Poirier bit the fingers of Michael Chandler. Well, he had to. Chandler was trying to gag him. 100%. 100%. Like, Chandler we've wanted this, to... We've seen this before. Anyway. Chandler wanted to finger fuck his face. I will just <laughs> say it right now. Boner. Yeah. Um, but I will also say when a fighter bites another fighter, that is a really perfectly acceptable point to stop the fight. And more fights should be stopped when somebody starts biting their opponent. And that's an insanely uh, primal technique. Yeah. And it has no place in sports of any kind. Yeah. It's just, it, it is, it is a show of a complete lack of self-control that makes somebody a danger to their opponent, the ref, cornerman, anybody. It has they, if you are willing to bite someone, that means that you're willing to go crazy enough that like you could just attack somebody because you and here's feel the thing though. It's it's like it's never it's never okay to bite someone in a in a, a sanctioned mixed martial arts fight. Yeah. There are certain situations where I can understand it, like Poirier. Yeah, yeah. Like I, or, if you're sticking your finger in somebody's or, mouth, then that's not okay either. So you're tit for tat. You're in a situation where you're just getting fucked up, and like you're you're in a literal survival mode. Like yeah. you're literally fighting for your life, or like that's where you go. But that's not what this but, was. And even if the even if that happens, then you should probably not be fighting anymore. Like if you're yeah, getting beat agreed. so badly that you have like to try to bite your way out of it, where it was I gouge and Jillian yes. Robertson, then MMA not is not okay. for you. MMA is not for you. Fighting is right. not for you. Right. 
but this wasn't that. Like he no. had the body lock. He had control. He was he controlling was the position. Actually grabbing the shorts of Lima as he was biting him. He had the shorts and he was biting. I thought he was complaining to the ref about the shorts. Yeah. He was like, ah, he bit me. I'm like, and he's like, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? A bite in 2024? Yeah. So. Wow. Dana White cut his ass. He did. And I like the MMA has let people get away with way too much over the years. It has allowed for really honestly, very uncontrolled, unhinged, violent people to have full fledged careers where they are not in control of their tools Who's and where they are Harris. Who's our Paul Harris? Sure. Like, uh, Vaga Vagabov, Gilbert, Gilbert Ivel. Yep, Vaga Vagabov over in the PFL. They gave him a shot. After, if you go back and watch his career on the Russian regionals, you will find multiple fights where the ref has had to pull him off of somebody, and he will fight through the ref to try to keep beating somebody. And the PFL brought him in. He had like one fight, and he did that right away. And it was just like this was so obvious. Yeah, and they had to cut him and send him back to fighting only in Russia. Remember, Gilbert Ivel knocked out the referee. Yeah, <laughs> the MMA has been so forgiving of this kind of stuff for so long. Like, I am totally fine with, you know, and this dude, Severino. Some other co some other company will give him fights. Oh, he's he's only twenty years old. Yeah, he's a kid. Like this is a kid. So. I don't think this is the end of the road for him, but it's no. definitely a hard learning lesson. Yeah, I mean, the UFC, they should cut him, and they shouldn't bring him back, but this won't be the end of his career. Maybe, and they, maybe they can bring him back later on. Hopefully he goes and gets some sports therapy or something. I mean, I'd love him to get real therapy, but if it's there just got to be fake winners don't cheat therapy, then I'm fine with that too. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was wild. I I just I'm curious to see what his uh what he has to say. Yeah, I'm trying to rationalize that. Yeah, and somebody will find it. He'll he will yeah. talk to somebody sooner or later about Lima it. Lima got a uh, bite bonus. He got twenty five grand, and he got and, the tattoo. Nope. And he got tw the tattoo, and he got another twenty five grand because he got the tattoo. Sick. So he got fifty <laughs> grand. For getting the for for getting bit and then getting a tattoo of the bite mark, yeah. and the same night he got that bite mark tattooed. First of all, put some like neosporin in there. Get the guy some shots. Yeah. Human mouths are the like dirtiest mouths in the animal kingdom. It's like Komodo dragon, a <laughs> uh, rabid dog person. That is like that is the the tier of dirty mouths. So yeah, get your shots and maybe getting a tattoo right after getting bit there was not the smartest idea, but it was really fun. Like just an hour afterward to be like, oh, I found a tattoo. Of course, it's, it's fucking Vegas. So you're going to find a tattoo parlor. I think, uh, yeah, rabies shots probably in order. Yeah. Did they call animal control? They, I, well, I mean, I hate to say it, but now that he's bit somebody, they're just going to have to, they're, they're going to have to destroy him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> they got to put him down. They got to. He's going to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's going to do it again. And, all right. Uh, other than that, Mick Parkin out jabbed Muhammad Usman. Who cares? So. <laughs> uh, yeah. That fight was shit. Um, yep. Yep. All right. Yeah, I'm not happy about it. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. You can find me on Twitter at these ain't time. You can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. We'll have a little bit of bonus oh, content and coming at you. MMAuncensored.com. You can find and me there. MMAuncensored.com. And we'll have a little bit of Twitter or we'll have a little bit of bonus content coming at you all. For those of you subscribing to the Substack. So thank you for tuning in and we will see you all next time.